wow, this is an incredible setup. And you know, so I come here, I was warned three things. One, make sure you have the right show. So the first thing I look at is, uh-oh, Canagro Expo. <laughs> it's actually it's this, this. Number two, don't go to the dad bar. I did that. Number three, <laughs> number three, don't have coffee. I did that too. So we're going to be in really great shape. But anyway, let's talk about the uh, sort of web and stuff. I, I asked how many people read this book. If you haven't read this book, go right out and buy it from Amazon or somebody else. Uh, this is my second book, Teaming with Nutrients, and now I have a third book, Teaming with Fungi, which of course means I have three books. It's a trilogy, and that now makes me Lord of the Roots. <laughs> yeah. Come on, guys, you're supposed to laugh a little bit here. All right, when I first started gardening years and years and years ago, well before I started doing anything with cannabis, maybe a year before cannabis, there was no, you know, there was aluminum foil. Out of nowhere, aluminum foil came out. I'm 70 years old. You know, and then, Plastic appeared out of nowhere, and, and, and we started to eat plastic, which is what margarine is. And we played with plastic, and we had brand new fertilizers that appeared out of nowhere. Instead of using, you know, horse manure, we had this great stuff. We had people spraying food so we wouldn't have blemishes on it. They invented, uh, you know, instant coffee. And we had a, a, a slogan, Better Living Through Chemistry. And we had a television show. There were only three stations, and one of the shows was, was Mr. Wizard. And he was on, and he would talk about science, and he had this little dreamy assistant. And it was sponsored by General Electric and the Better Living Through Chemistry. And of course, some of us took that chemistry way too far as we got older. Um, but today, well, here's the other thing when I, was, when I was a kid. You knew who was growing weed because the light was always purple coming from the window. This is the original purple haze. And you grew weed wherever you could grow it, where nobody else would find it. You know, you had to be really careful, you know, because your parents looked and you know, all that kind of stuff. And what you grew, you know, was mostly sticks and stones and seeds, and it was not very good weed. Uh, unless you had a PhD in chemistry, and you could do hydroponics, and it required a PhD in chemistry in order to be able to do hydroponics. Now today, we don't have a little bit of foil in anything, you know, we have instant popcorn, no little foil, no little foil in our TV dinners. This is our instant coffee, uh, you know, we don't use those powders. We all have telephones we carry around, we have television sets in our telephones and magazines and everything we ever want. And, you know, it's just an incredible world, but we still, you know, rely on chemistry very often when we're growing, and particularly if we're growing commercially. Uh, you know, we have an, an overabundance of a reliance on chemistry in our lives, and unfortunately gardeners, and unfortunately some cannabis gardeners in particular. Now, if we spray stuff, because we have crops, we want to, we want to save. Well, you know, it's kind of crazy. What part of medical marijuana allows for spraying with chemistry, you know? Uh, it just doesn't make any sense to me, and, 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 you know, it's not moral and it's not ethical to be spraying something that you're selling or giving away to family members or using yourself that has a chemical in it that you know is not good for you. Uh, it's just not moral, it's not ethical, it's absolutely not right. Some things are so obvious, you don't really need to say it. So why am I saying it? Because we're going to have big pharma and you know who else coming down our butts, and they're going to be definitely think in a different way than we think, and we're going to be able to distinguish ourselves by being the clean green, uh, you know, not, not, not the uh, big corporate terrorist stuff. So um, our goals today are to, you know, figure out how to grow some really amazing cannabis easily without using, uh, you know, uh, chemicals and using the soil food web in order to be able to do it. Um, I can give the whole talk off of this slide. The soil food web involves plants taking photosynthetic energy and using it not to produce the bud, not to produce the terpenes, but to produce exudates that drip out of the root that attract microbes that end up feeding the plant. And so that's sort of the soil food web. I'm going to show you how it works. Uh, it all is based upon the roots. Um, we've got a bunch of plants sitting around on a you know, Friday afternoon. It's hot. One of them says, geez, I'm hungry. Let's get some Mexican. Not nah, French. Nah. One of them goes, wait, I want Japanese food. And so they produce the right kind of exudates, which they drip out of their roots. These are their roots. Uh, this is the roots of one of those plants. Drips the exudate out, then it produces. 
in order to be able to attract Japanese bacteria so that they can have Japanese food. Now these bacteria eat these exudates, and they in turn are eaten by uh, uh, nematodes uh, and protozoa. And they poop out the excess, and that excess contains the Japanese food that goes into the plant. Same thing with the fungus down there, so it could be a Japanese bacteria or a Japanese fungus. Then if it wanted American food, the plant would change the exudate itself to produce a different kind of molecule to attract a different kind of food. So it's, it's, it's self-control. So if it wants American food, well, it just changes the exudate and gets American food. You should be thinking sweat when you think about exudates, because you're exudating right now. Your sweat is attracting bacteria and fungi. And they're attracting nematodes and protozoa. You're covered with protozoa. If you disappeared right now, your shapes would stay here because of all the protozoas that are on you. Which sounds like fun until you see some of the pictures I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes. <laughs> this particular picture of, of exudates happens to be a, a, a kind of exudate that's identical to white blood cells. So not only do they go out and get food, you know, get track bacteria, but these guys go out and they lock up things that the plant doesn't want to take up, like arsenic. So these exudates do some pretty amazing things. And of course, these bacteria and fungi, they all contain antibiotics and whatnot, and so they're doing all sorts of things in the soil. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, you, the plant's trying to get the largest and the most diverse population it can, because that's what protects the plant. Diversity, if stupid Donald Trump would ever understand, is what protects us. Yeah. It's when we're all the same that we turn into Roy Moore. Okay, sorry. Um, but in any case, large diversity, because let's face it, if we were all alligators in here and one of us was a chicken, oh my goodness gracious. You know, that's <laughs> so you want to have diversity because that's what protects us, that's what gives the antibiotic mix, keep populations in control, etc., etc. And again, God help the Republicans if they don't really understand that. In a teaspoon of good soil, there should be 500 million to a trillion bacteria and archaea. Now bacteria, you know, was what I had in the first edition of the book. The second edition of the book had archaea because I didn't know they existed in the first edition when it was written. These were only in the ocean, they were only in geysers, and now they discover they're in the soil. Now they discover that they're the dominant in the second uh, uh, organism in the second step of the nitrogen fixing, and you've never heard of them because they were discovered in 1978. They didn't make the textbooks until 1998. Uh, it's the third branch of life, archaea. They look like bacteria, they have a different, a different thing. You can look them up. Uh, these guys, along with the bacteria, they eat sugars and they break down simple to digest things. The ends of long carbon molecules. And they eat and they eat and they breed and they breed. You took two bacteria, you put them in a petri dish, ideal conditions, six weeks later, the earth is covered with 20 feet of bacteria, blah, 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 you know, they're unbelievable. And they form a slime in order to colonize and to protect themselves and to communicate with each other. And this slime is very, very important to what we do because the slime, think about brushing your teeth in the morning, you're brushing off bacterial slime. You're all licking your teeth right now, it's okay. Uh, everybody does it. You use a lot of energy to get that slime off because it's really strong, full of bacteria talking to each other. And producing a pH above seven. So if your soils have bacterial dominance, then they have a pH above seven and they have all of this slime which sticks to little individual particles of soil and causes them to stick to each other. So soil structure and pH come from bacterial slime. This is where it starts. And in that teaspoon of soil, you have 14 feet of invisible fungal hyphae. 14 feet, you can't see it, but it's there. And those invisible fungal hyphae, uh, you know, what, they, they're exactly like plant cells. Fungus. People don't understand it because we never study them. Uh, they, they're just like plants, only they don't have you know that little chloroplasty kind of thing in there. They can't make you know they don't make chlorophyll, um, and they weave through those bacterially stuck together pieces of soil and make even bigger conglomerates of soil. And they're not bricks. These things that are getting stuck together, they've got you know pore spaces, and so you get 
poor spaces, they hold air, where the little guys can hide from the bigger guys, when it rains, they hold water. This is, a, this is soil structure, bacteria and fungus. Um, and these bacteria, they digest extracellularly by dripping enzymes, acids out of their bodies, breaks down the stuff, and then they take it back in through their bodies. So when they dominate in the soil, instead of having a pH above seven, we have a pH below seven. And they are unbelievably strong acids. Here is a, a fungal hyphae breaking into some, uh, some uh, uh, feldspar to get some of the nutrient minerals out of that rock. They're phenomenal. Uh, and they go out, some of them, and bring back nutrients for the plant in return for those actually. Some of them just decay stuff, break things down. Some of them actually attach essentially to the plant and bring back some. And those are the mycorrhizal fungi. And they bring back phosphorus and nitrogen and zinc and copper and iron and calcium and magnesium and water to the plant. And if you don't have them, your plants don't live. 96% of all plants on Earth form a micro, uh, uh, an association, symbiotic, with these fungus. And cannabis happens to be a very big partnership former. Um, so here's how they work. You got two seedlings sitting in the sun. One of them says, geez, you know, I'd really like a little bit of bologna today. Bologna sandwich would be really nice. And so what does it do? Well, it goes and mixes up the exudates, okay? Because it's got to get the right exudate. It puts the exudates out into the soil, right? Catches the right fungus, and then the fungus reels it in, and the fungus, one end of it, goes into the plant. There's the entry point. Unbelievable picture. Just spectacular. What about the other end? The other end goes out to find the baloney. Okay? Are you ready? And these days, it's so damn easy. <laughs> it's just goes, I love this audience. You let me do this, I'm so sorry. Um, it goes out and finds the baloney and brings it back to the plant. Because the plant says, hey, no baloney, no extra days. And so it's a perfect relationship, and they're both very happy. And what's even better? is there it is with the bologna sandwich, a little seedling, very happy. It continues to, to, to nurture this relationship and the plant grows bigger. It's unbelievable. <laughs> and what's really cool is that it shares mycorrhizal associations and nutrients with things next to it. So if you got two plants next to each other, even if they're different kinds of plants, a marigold and a redwood tree, they can share sometimes, not always, their nutrient mix, which is pretty incredible when you think about what we do and how we do it. Uh, so you can have stuff in the shade, stuff in the sun, and it's all the same height. How's that happen? Hmm, they're sharing nutrients. It's pretty amazing. Now, there are seven different kinds of mycorrhizal fungi. There are two that are important to agriculture, and there's only one that we care about. It's an endomycorrhizal, which means that it's invisible. You can't see it unless you stain it. Uh, it, it, it endo means in, so it goes sort of, it, it penetrates into the root more than the ecto, which is the other kind. Um, and this is what they look like when they're inside. So buy my third book and you can read all about them as boring as possible. No, it's not very exciting. Um, what you need to understand is that what you are forming is a mycorrhizae, or a mycorrhiza, mycorrhizae plural. And what's forming it is a cell, a root cell, and a mycorrhizal fungi. So you are not buying mycorrhiza. And if you're selling a product that's labeled mycorrhiza, you're labeled it wrong. You're selling mycorrhizal fungi, and mycorrhiza is the partnership between the fungi and the root that forms when you put the mycorrhizal fungi on. Okay, a little craziness. Uh, and here's what the, uh, one that uh, associates with cannabis looks like. It's a, a, a vest, the secular, and it's arviscular, it's vesicular because it has these little, uh, brown, this little brown thing there is a little vesicle, contains liquids, that, that's where the transfer takes place. Between this little gadget and the, uh, and the plant and the roof, and then you've got these little tree-like structures that are arbuscular, so it's called vesicular and arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. These arbuscular looks like little trees, they're inside the cells. Can't see them unless you stain them, so here they are stained. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem in our, in our thing. So we, we know it's an endomycorrhizal relationship. It used to be called rhizophagus, it has 50 different names on all the different labels that you pick up because they keep renaming the damn thing. And finally, we've gotten to the point where we know the DNA. 
And so from now on, it's called Rhizophagus interacides. And if you write down one thing, other than remember to buy all of the Lord of the Roots books as soon as this talk is over, <laughs> write down Rhizophagus interacides because this is the stuff that makes your cannabis grow well. And I'm talking really well. And if you want a terrific one, just for fun, just to see some wonderful pictures, Google Wow Mycorrhizal. And you'll, you'll see the kind that I've been using lately. These are the old names, Glomus Mossy, Glomus Irregularis, Rhizophagus Irregularis. There's probably two or three other ones, but Rhizophagus Interacetes is the one you want. And if you want to see anything else on the label, and you're going up to cannabis, you're wasting your time, because this is the only one that forms the partnership uh, with the cannabis. There it is. <laughs> Have I made my point? Here is a leaf from uh, the wow test that I did. Wow. That's a big plant. Well, maybe you don't get a sense of how big that is. Maybe you don't get a big sense of how big it is if you put it on a gigantic frying pan. But that's not a little frying pan. So it was, wow, it was right. Turned out, unfortunately, a male plant. <laughs> Can't wait to get some more. So yeah, it's a big, big, uh, big difference. Big, big difference. Uh, you put the stuff on the seeds because you want to infect the plant right away. Seeds, if you can. If you're buying clones, you put it on right away as soon as you get it. Uh, you get it, it has to touch the roots. There's a communication from the plant to the uh, mycorrhizal fungi that says, whoop, over here. And so they've got to be there. You won't find it in compost. You have to add it to your soils. Uh, and you want to put it not only on the seeds, but in the soil, mix it around so that as the roots grow, they grow into more spores and you get more colonies of the stuff. All right, so what, what about this stuff? Well, here's the first thing. It produces glomalin, or glomalin, depending on how you pronounce it. This is where all of the carbon, or most of the carbon, in the soil comes from. It comes from glomalin produced by these fungus, mycorrhizal fungus. And it's stained, it looks green. Uh, it, this stuff provides rigidity, okay, to the fungal hyphae. Uh, it, it, it solidifies the filaments. In the fungal hyphae, I think that left picture I'm going to have to get rid of, given what happened now, Franken, uh, and it seals the gaps. This is also pretty important. Uh, anyway, uh, you use much less fertilizer when you're uh, using mycorrhizal fungi, and it's unbelievable. You get much better root systems. Again, incredible. You use much less water because those vesicles they hold water, and in drought situations, they use that water to feed the plant. As people discovered in Illinois three or four years ago when there was a gigantic drought, and they, those that didn't use mycorrhizal uh, fungi lost their crop, those that did had a crop. Phenomenal. All right. They provide protection for things like nematodes for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, they're coated with, uh, because they're fungus, they're coated with chitin. Okay, it's hard to chew. Think about, you know, would you rather have a hamburger, well, let me do it, a hamburger or a hamburger coated with, uh, you know, a shrimp shell? Yeah. Well, you know, you're gonna take the hamburger without the shrimp shell, because uh, it's easier to eat, easier to get through. This provides some protection. Um, you know, and, and of course, if you're a mycorrhizal fungi, you, that white stuff is pretty hard to get through to get that stuff. You got that slime, okay, so it creates a pH, so they also have their own rhizosphere kind of thing, it's called a microsphere, and so they've got their own sort of soil food web, they're feeding all sorts of organisms up and down the whole fungal hyphae, which are doing stuff. Now, so again, fungus, slime, uh, I mean, bacteria, slime, pH, above seven, slime uh, uh, for fungus, below seven. Two different kinds of soil, obviously. So here's what's going on in your soil. You've got, uh, uh, you know, all this bacteria and fungi being attracted by the uh, 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 enzyme, not enzymes, the, um, uh, there's the dab bar, uh, by the, <laughs> <laughs> being, being attracted uh, by the exudates, and they in turn attract the protozoa, the edum, and uh, the, the nematodes. They even poop out the excess and the baby. Plant gets fed. Uh, now, all of this poop, oddly enough, turns out to be a form of nitrogen ammonia. Okay, all of it, always. But if you have nitrogen fixing bacteria, they take that NH4 and turn it into NO2, 3. So 
If you have bacterially dominated soil, you're going to have nitrogen fixing bacteria there, and it's going to take that stuff and turn it into nitrogen. So fungally dominated is going to stay as ammonia, and if you have fungally plants that like fungally dominated uh, soils, they need that. And other plants, they like nitrates. Those are the plants that like bacterially dominated soils. Well, guess what? Cannabis likes bacterially dominated soils. So, you want to use things that attract and feed bacteria. Okay? And molasses and manures and guanos, this kind of good stuff. You know. Right soils. You want to use cover crops that, uh, you know, nitrogen fixate. Because uh, that's really good stuff. Helps the plant. Uh, this happens to be some stuff that you would uh, you would have on for fungal. You want to have a little bit of fungal because you don't want to have just pure bacterial soil. You've got to have at least 5% fungal. Uh, give some soil structure. Oh, and then I mentioned that they've recently discovered that these bacteria, they talk to each other using electricity and this new stuff that people keep talking about called terp terpenes, terpenes, terpenes. They talk in terpenes. Wait a minute. They're just like us. So they're communicating in terpenes, you know, they're like in that big tent there. <laughs> hey, it's a pineapple terpene over here. Anyway, here's a, uh, a little fusarium uh, speaking to an unidentified bacteria uh, using uh, terpene as their, as their language. Um, so you've got fertilizer bags, okay? The bacteria and the fungi, they've been attracted by the exudates. See how simple this is? And they're then uh, eaten and spread by the fertilizer spreaders, protozoa and nematodes. So let's take a look at the uh, protozoa. This is an amoeba. Everybody always said they saw one in biology class, but nobody ever did, so here's the picture. Uh, and uh, this is the protozoa that everybody did study in biology, but everybody has said, you forgot, didn't you? What's the name? Come on. Paramecium. Didn't you study paramecium?s Yes, you did. You were absent that whole month? <laughs> okay, this is what the, each one of these paramecium will eat 10,000 bacterium a day and then poop out the excess. That's a lot of food. If you've got a lot of these guys, you've got a tremendous amount of food. So, you know, you might want to think about a protozoa tea to cycle the bacteria that you've got in your soils. Uh, that uh, last picture was what they look like. I'm not going to push the button, but they look like in an electron microscope. Um, anyway, uh, tea kit's easy. You just take straw or hay coated with protozoa, put it into a, a bubbler, or just put it into a bucket of water, stir it two or three times a day. After two or three days, you'll be able to see the paramecium running around in there. After 10 days in the soil, they're cycling like mad. All right, then you got nematodes. You got 40 to 50 nematodes in that teaspoon of soil. Uh, you know, some of them are good, most of them are good. There are only four or five bad nematodes, the rest of them are good ones. The bad one happens to form these little things when they get inside the roots and your plants turn yellow. Um, you know, they're differentiated by their mouth parts. And, uh, you know, this one is one you probably think, oh, I don't want that in my kitchen sink. Uh, but that's just sort of a rubber spatula, it's not a drill and it's just waving water in, bacteria into the mouth. Uh, this is the one you want to worry about a little bit more because it sticks right into you and then you know, sucks out all the protoplasm in your body. Um, this one uh, attacks dogs and you know, this one causes hookworm. So other than that, you know, they're kind of fun. Um, these are some of the beneficial ones. They, they can attack the bad guys. Uh, they get in there, they bring in a little bacteria. The bacteria start to grow inside the bad guy. The eggs that they lay inside hatch and then they eat the bacteria. Meanwhile, the bacteria has been eating the bug and you know, it gets really ugly. You end up with a dead bug. They leave and they always make sure they take a little bit of the bacteria with them so that they can repeat what they need to do with the next one. So look at that plant when it breeds and opens up. Woo-wee! Get a lot of nematodes. Uh, so the, the, they really work when you get the right ones. And, and there's lots of them being studied now. Uh, and it's certainly something you ought to be thinking about using. All sorts of things in the soil food web. You can see these things by making something called a Berlaise funnel, which is just you know basically a, a, a bottle. Maybe I have how to make it, but it's in the book. Uh, and you gather these things. These are soil food web organisms. They're taking those bound together particles of soil and they're moving between them, creating tunnels as they run through this larva stage and they're eating and screwing each other and doing all this stuff and it's unbelievable. And these tunnels act as air spaces and pore spaces and hiding places and when it rains the bad air is pushed out and good air comes in. So again, soil structure. It's 
all about the soil food web. It's not about you or me. It's about what the soil food web is doing. And I say, dog eat dog world down there, and things are getting eaten, and then they're getting eaten again, and pooped out and eaten and pooped out, and eventually ends up down in the bacteria and the fungi. And eventually, if a plant's around and it wants that kind of food, it goes into the plant. So you got all sorts of killing going on down there. It's just, you know, it's like Congress. Uh, and so, <laughs> so you got all these mites in there, different kinds of mites. And you want to know the difference between the organid and the ganesid mite, because one of them eats fungi, and you know, one of them eats plant material. And so if you have ones that eat the fungi, then you know you've got fungi in your soil, et cetera, et cetera. All this stuff is in the book. They've got a grove beetle running around there, killing things and doing terrible stuff. Uh, he's almost gone. Uh, you know. And then, of course, you've got the bigger things that are in the soil food web. Bears poop in the woods. That poop is part of the soil food web. That bear is an organism in the soil food web. I'm, I'm sorry for repeating this for those who've heard this talk. That's my window in Anchorage, Alaska. If you look carefully, not so carefully, you'll see that the window is open. And you'll see that there's just a screen there. The bear is looking in through the screen. And you see a little crease in that cushion there? That's where my head was a nanosecond before my wife took the picture. You know, hearing this heavy breathing and uh, not watching porn, and I kind of woke up. And you never know what you're going to see outside the window in Anchorage, Alaska. You might see a moose. Again, they poop in the woods, you know, that's all part of the soil food web, you know. And once, one spring, I happen to catch a pair of camels. <laughs> sorry, give the whole talk just for that joke. Um, beat me up, I'm sorry, okay. Um, now, we do other things to the, to the soil, uh, you know, that we have to be thinking about. So one of the things we were trained to do from day one was rototill. Rototill breaks up the soil food web, it breaks up the fungal uh, structure. The stuff that's up here, you know, gets cut down there. The worms get cut in half. They don't live. You don't get two worms. You only get, a, you know, you get two halves of a dead worm. Uh, you know, it's a terrible situation. And, and, and everybody rototills at one time or another because it's fun. Uh, you know, for guys, it's the motorcycle that your wife will let you have. You know, the engine between your legs, finally, she lets me have a motorcycle. Eh, it goes two miles less, you know, an hour, maybe. But anyway, uh, so people roll until we break up that wonderful soil food web. And then, of course, we do things like we spray when we start having problems. And, uh, you know, who knows what to spray because they don't teach us this in school. So we go and seek expert advice at Lowe's or True Value, you know. And that pimpy faced teenager at, uh, you know, Home Depot turns out to really know his chemicals. <laughs> and then we do things like this, you know, uh, this was obviously back in the 50s when you were allowed to do things like this, both in terms of the picture as well as the chemical. Uh, you know, I'm convinced this woman probably died about six months later. <laughs> Not freaking believable. You know, and so when you use these chemicals and you do this rototilling and you break up the soil food web or you kill things in the soil food web, you end up with all sorts of problems. Your pH may not be where you want because you don't have the right kind of dominance in your soil. The glomalin isn't being produced because you don't have any mycorrhizal fungi. That glomalin puts in 37% of the carbon in your soil. It's not humic acids, not folic acids, it's glomalin. Those other ones are like 11%, so key, so you don't have it. No nitrogen fixation because you've killed off the nitrogen fixing bacteria. You know, you're using chemicals. The plant says, I don't even produce exudates. Because I'm getting this stuff for free. Forget the mycorrhizal fungi, they don't need them either. So it's the plant alone until it runs out of food. And you're there and you go, holy shit, the plant's dying. And so you give it more food or more chemical. And it's an ever increasing need because you killed the soil food web and now you have to become the soil food web. And that means you have to work. This is supposed to be fun. This is supposed to be easy money. Right? You know, uh, that's what the chemical companies are telling us. So anyway, uh, you want to stop using these chemicals to create these situations where you end up with no partnerships, dependency, and of course then you start getting diseases because once these things start to go, uh-oh, you know, it's really bad. So what do you do? You put the microbes back, and it's really easy to do. You can use compost, you can use compost teas, you can use mulches, and you can use uh, uh, like a fungi in the right situation. So compost has everything in it you ever need, okay? You buy that Malibu compost that's over here, you go into the Malibu garden to take a look at it, and you're going to end up with all the nematodes and all the protozoa and all the bacteria and all the fungi you ever need. 
No mycorrhizal fungi because it's not in the compost. You have to add that. It's only there when the plant sends out the signal. There's no plants in the compost, so it's not sending out any signals of plant energy. Um, now, compost, you've got to have somebody to turn the pile for you, though. So that's a big problem. You know what I mean? If your spouse isn't willing to do the work, <laughs> you know, uh, and you've got to know where your compost comes from if you're buying it. And your inputs, where are they coming from? Are they coated with, with good stuff or are they coated with chemicals? Like tetracycline, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you got to know what's going on. It's very, very important. Um, you know, and compost teas. Now, compost should be made bacterially dominated and fungally dominated, depending on you know what you put into it, how much green, how much brown, so on the books. Um, uh, or you can go talk to Dr. Elaine Ingham, she's, she's right here in this area, actually. Um, uh, this is Harvard University uh, uh, with a compost tea machine. Now, if you talk to the uh, United States Department of Agriculture, they will tell you compost tea is all fraud. Uh, the Cooperative Extension Service isn't allowed to mention it, but of course they're not allowed to talk about cannabis either, so what do they know? Uh, I always like to say to the Cooperative Extension Service, see this lady over here? That's the, that's the president of Harvard University. That's, that's their first compost tea machine, and they have about 10 of them now. They turn their entire campus into a green space. All over the world, their campuses are organic. Everything they have now, they compost, including their exams. I mean, my goodness gracious. And if it's good enough for Harvard, it's good enough for me. When you park your car in Harvard Yard, you're parking your car in a compost tea yard. Now, you use compost tea and you can make fungally dominated and bacterially dominated and it is spectacular stuff and it's wonderful, wonderful. And if you don't have the time to make compost tea, and there's lots of different kinds of brewers, you can make your own, um, you can make compost extract. Oh, incidentally, uh, there are some brewers here that are just spectacular, both uh, over here, Synergy, and, and over here, this one of the biggest ones I've ever seen, uh, absolutely spectacular. You can, you can make an extract by just simply taking compost and cheesecloth just in water for 15 minutes. Now you're not going to multiply anything, but you're going to strip out those woven together, you know, stuck together in water. You won't multiply it like you do tea, where you add water and energy, and all of a it takes 24 hours, but you get good stuff out of that compost. So it's a great way to go as well. Um, green stuff is good for uh, uh, you know uh, bacteria, and brown stuff is good for uh, fungi. Simple as that. Um, you know, the end game is to increase the, bike, the microbial biomass. Now, there are two new things I've learned since I spoke here last year. The first one I'm going to talk about right now is called a microbiometer, and it measures microbial biomass. And you can look it up at www.microbiometer.com. Okay? And, and microbiomass, we want to increase. The second thing we're going to talk about at the end of my uh, the talk here, and it's going to amaze you as a, a new kind of light, but uh, you know, microbes hold the nutrients, they cycle the nutrients, they, they recycle the nutrients, and so if you have high microbial biomass, all things considered, you know, not, not soil full of poop, but if you have normal soil that you're growing in and you're adding good stuff to it, you test the microbial biomass. If it's over 500, it's great. If it's over 800, you don't have to feed the soil anymore. Holy crow! And you can measure when the biomass drops, when the plant stops producing exudates, right before it starts to flower. So you know ahead of time that your plants are about to flower. Ooh, that might save you some time and money. Anyway, biomass is very, very important. And you know, you want to have big, healthy plants. And if you've got good biomass in your soil, you've got the best opportunity to have nutritious plants, good terpene in your plants, big plants. Uh, you know, uh, now as far as I'm concerned, chemistry <laughs> uh, would have been a doctor today, but it wasn't for methyl methyl chicken wire. But there are only 18 elements you have to worry about. This is in my second book. Uh, you know, and, and we tend to, the rest is filler. You know? So every time you think about putting seaweed down, that seaweed ain't feeding the plant. It's got 56 different nutrients in it, but only 18 of them are feeding that plant. That's the only one the plant needs. Now, on the other hand, they are, that seaweed is feeding the microbes that feed the plant. And so in that regard, very good and very healthy. So, you know, 17, 18 uh, elements, you, you can't play cards with that, but if you do the combination, it turns out, you know, uh, that it's like 56 zillion, quadrillion different kinds of molecules can be made by various combinations. You know, there are only 14 mineral nutrients, 5% of the stuff that you, you know, 
and the rest of it, 95% of what is in a plant, water, oxygen, carbon, you know, the stuff that makes beer. So it's that 5% you really want to pay attention to. And it only goes into the plant through these little special channels, each channel designed for one kind of molecule. Each channel made by every individual cell themselves. Each channel, sometimes only used for two or three molecules to come through, like boron. You don't need very many boron to form a flower. So only four, five, six, seven, eight molecules of boron, and it made this whole structure just for that. Okay? So you're feeding your plants. This, these are the only things that really count. This is the ionic form of all the nutrients and how they get into the plant. They go through those little things. But the soil food web creates this incredible biomass so that those nutrients are available. All of them. All the time when the plant needs it, it needs to call on it. Uh, you know, and it all starts with those action days that the plant puts out. You're feeding microbes when you're going organic. You're not feeding the plant. And you've got to concentrate on those microbes as much as possible. Right? Not the plant. Uh, ooh, make one backwards. Okay, let's see here. So the end game is the biomass. You want to make sure you test your soils. Okay? Because we know the rule is the least amount that's missing is the one that's going to screw you up. But you've got to know it. You can't guess by looking at it. Don't think you know by looking at a yellow leaf your plant needs nitrogen. That's bullshit. There are 180 different reasons why your plant carry the yellow leaves. Okay? It just happens to be nitrogen is the one that's easy to take pictures of and write about as a, as a gardener, you know, a garden run. It's crazy. Test your soil. Biologically, soil food web and other places, do your own microbiometer test and get a chemical test too because you need to know what's in it. Okay? These cells are important and what goes on in these cells depend on what's in that soil. In, in, there are billions of these cells, like in this little period right here, there are five uh, to 50 plant cells. And that little teeny period on a book, you know, not here. Uh, uh, you know, these are small. These are really small, like small minds. Um, but anyway, uh, and there are lots of them. I mean, these are how many atoms are in an individual plant cell. That's how many atoms are in that plant cell. And so each one of these atoms, you know, relies on the stuff that you're giving it. And we don't ever think about these things at all. I mean, we're just like, okay. And they produce these hundreds. They produce all of the molecules that are inside a plant. Inside every single cell of a plant, there are a thousand different kinds of enzymes. Now remember, there's 200 gazillion, gazillion of atoms in there. There are a thousand different kinds of enzymes, 10,000 of each one of them, and that's just the enzymes alone in every single cell of them. Unbelievable, and they produce sugars like crazy, so enough so that you can fill up a train that would go around the Earth, uh, you know, a 30 million car train would go around the Earth 120 times. That's how much sugar is produced every year by plants. It's just a staggering number. The only thing that comes closer are those K-cups. You know, the people use for coffee. They're just <laughs> and these enzymes are unbelievable, but they work best at 78 degrees. That's why your plants work best at that temperature. So you want to keep it at that temperature if you possibly can. You know, most of the growth occurs at night. Keep the temperature at night at 78 degrees, you're going to get maximum beautiful growth. You know, a lot of this stuff is pretty obvious. Uh, you know, uh, you just have to react properly to what's going on. But you only can do this stuff if you test and you know what's going on. You shouldn't have to fake anything, you know what I mean? Uh, anyway, I have to throw this in here just because I want to kick the screen is what I want to do. All right. Um, soil is key. And you want to make sure it's clean and pure and organic. It has to smell nice. That smell is, is from a, a substance being produced by a streptococci, a bacteria, the kind of stuff that we use in medicines. It's called geosin. Oh, you know, you have good soil when you have a... Beautiful. It's a condominium for the soil food group. So you want to have the very best soil that you possibly can, a nice mix. You want to make it a beautiful condominium, not a slum condominium, you know, not a worker condominium. You want to make it a luxury condominium for the best stuff. You want to, you want to fill it up with the right things and be able to take care of the pests, okay? You want to keep them under control biologically if you can. Uh, you know, you want to add the right organisms. Then you've got to be thinking about consumption, out competition, interference, and reduction. Okay, you gotta think like a soil food buddy. And these are the questions you have to ask yourself. And you ask yourself these questions because if you can answer them, you won't have problems anymore. Yeah, they're not that easy. They require a little bit of work, but you need to do it. We've got competition coming down the road like we cannot believe. And if you don't think they're gonna go and get those people from 
Harvard who are using that compost tea for their, you know, for Bayer and Monsanto and everybody else. They're crazy. Of course they are. So we got to be on top of this stuff right now. Uh, you know, we have to know what works for aphids when we have them. it's not necessarily a particularly bad problem. Uh, you know, thrips, you got to know that vanilla might work. You know, uh, a little vanilla trap, for example. And be clever about how we do this stuff and, and use the right mites for them. Uh, look, it's all the same little puppy. Hmm. Gee, good little business to sell these, wouldn't it? Uh, you know, we have to use the right kinds of stuff for each one. And we have to, we have to pay consultants sometimes to come and teach us how to do this stuff. And when we have a bad infestation, we have, to, we have to bring them in so that they can tell us what we need. We need to be using cover crops to add to the soil. Too many of us are throwing our soil away after each grow. Oh my God, you spend all that time making good soil. Then the plant puts in the extra dates that you want to have for growing cannabis, even male plants. And what do we do? We throw it out. No. Plant in it again. Not even compost it. Just plant in it again. You're taking care of the soil. You're testing it. It'll be fine. Anyway, if you want to compost it, you can certainly compost it. But, but you know, I love growing female plants in my male plant pots where I just cut the top off because the roots will go down the old root systems. It's easier for them. They can grow faster, better, with less energy. And the less nutrient in, oh man, it's the way to go. Anyway, you want to use those kind of, and you want to place track properly. What you want to do is do things properly. If you've got to bring in an outside consultant to do it, do it. Because it's worth it. We're going to have competition. Uh, I love these guys. He's growing hydroponically. These guys live in those little down there in the root systems, and they see something to eat. They're so desperate down there. They go, oh, I hate general hydroponic food. Give me some of mine. And pfft, eats it right away. Crazy. Um, yeah, so you want to use the soil food there for your advantage. And you know, you're not going to just pick it up in today's lecture. If Elaine is ever speaking to you, you might, God, break your leg, you come down here to hear her, for God's sakes, and take notes and film it. I'm a joker compared to her. I mean, she is unbelievable. You want to soak up as much of this stuff as you possibly can. You want to use that uh, the rhizophagus. Uh, it's just absolutely unbelievable. Wow. The guy called it wow for a reason. He discovered it. Using, he discovered it himself. I mean, other people discovered it. But he discovered that it was what made the big pumpkins. And he won the international pumpkin contest two years in a row before I think you told other people about it. Um, <laughs> unbelievable. And you want to use the right lights. And we're going to be talking about lights just for two minutes at the end here. Uh, uh, I'm going to have my friend Sin and Kat show you a new light called a plasma light. The most efficient thing ever. And, and the reason why I'm excited about it is because the sun is the best. Let's face it. Organics and sun. What goes together better? You know? I mean, it's, it's just the way it's supposed to happen. And, and the, the LEDs, they don't quite cut it, you know? And the HIDs, we know they don't cut it. This new plasma lighting, if you've never seen a plasma light, you're about to see one today uh, in about five minutes. Anyway, you want to use the right stuff. Uh, you want to pay particular attention to what your stuff does to the other stuff. So when you use a light, is that light helping your bugs or hurting your bugs? It might be actually helping bugs breed. It might actually be killing off powdery mildew. They now have lights to do that. So there's a synergistic effect of all other stuff together. You've got to stop looking at it as, well, I'm just going to go get IPM. No, if you use IPM with the wrong kind of lights, it's not going to work right. Use it with the right lights, it enhances it. So it's a whole, a whole big different thing. And there's more and more of this stuff on the market. Oh my God, it's coming. It's everywhere. Uh, don't take pictures when you're stoned. Uh, <laughs> you know, this stuff is everywhere. It's just, it's just, uh, you know, and, and what fun. I mean, what fun to use bugs, to watch a praying mantis, you know, bring your kids in and get them hooked on what you're doing. Oh man, 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 man. And the paramecium tea, you know, it's unbelievable. I never thought you'd, you'd sell little bags of straw, you know what I mean? Uh, and get away with the cover covers. Definitely want to use it. Want to build that microbial bio mesh. Want to measure it with a bio, uh, you know, bio uh, microbiometer. Uh, and and you want to use compost wherever you possibly can. And you want to use compost tea. And you want to use the right mulches. So brown mulches are for fungal. Green mulches are for Cannabis. Use green mulches. Go get your grass clippings. Go around your plants. When you take down that male plant, if you're not going to use the leaves for oil, my God, use them right there on the plant. You're growing. Gee, willikers. 
uh, you know, reuse them and recycle those extra dates. Those extra, that plant spends 50 to 60 percent of its photosynthetic energy producing those extra dates. It's in the soil. Don't throw it out. It's good stuff. Um, yeah, and test it. Test. Let me say it again. Test. Most, I'm not going to ask because the last time I did it, I was so, I was so pillared by people afterwards. They were embarrassed because nobody raised their hand. This is when I asked, how many people here test? You've got to test. Okay, that's good. That's good, but not everybody. So there's the biometer test incidentally on the left. Soil food web test. Uh, you know, you've got to test. Why? Because information's power. Information is power and you're stupid if you don't get that information, okay? Uh, so information is power. Um, boy, that's a nice looking set of plants. Uh, oh, nice design here, you know? So yeah, you can use the soil food web indoors. The soil food web is not just for outdoors. Plants are plants. It doesn't matter whether they're inside or outside. In fact, you know, we're getting to the point where, I hate to say it, I think indoor growing, you know, with supplemental outdoor sunlight's the way that people are gonna be. Bigger, bigger facilities, whether we like it or not, you know. So lights like this, you know, and soil food will like this make tremendous amounts of sense. So you definitely want to use it. Uh, you want to use Google. Google is the Canada's grower's best friend. But you know, Donald Trump is right in one thing. Occasionally, there's a little bit of fake news on Google. Uh, you know, like flushing. How many people here flush? Okay, keep your hands down. <laughs> Yeah, flushing, what a waste of time. Okay, sorry. Um, you know, so you read Google, and boy, all it says is flush, 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 flush. Read my book, it doesn't seem to make any sense to flush when you really understand what happens in that cell, and you see those little channels where the nutrients go in and things come out, and you know, wait a minute, flushing? How can it, how can it possibly work? It doesn't. Okay, uh, you know, duck, 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 if you don't want to use Google, because those are the big bad guys. Um, Sorry, uh, and we want information we can get anytime and anywhere we want. You know, you're all carrying around a cell phone. You're out there in the field looking at your plant and there's something wrong. Don't wait until after dinner. Look it up right away. Get the answer. We live in a terrific world. And again, you can bet the big guys are all doing this in spades. We've got to stay a couple of steps ahead of them. We just have to. It's all right, so I always say to people, if you're not convinced, just think about this. You know those redwoods, the ones that haven't been burned down? Uh, you know, they have been growing 500 years, 600 years. They're 750 feet tall. How did they get that big without any miracle growth? You know, without any roundup? They team with microbes just like you should, because it's the only way to go. So thank you very much. And